want to respect folks time you started um i forgot to ask um our distinguished guest but our hope is that we're recording our conversation between uh the two of us and or the three of us two of you and me and then when we go into open discussion uh with the community uh we'll kick off the recording so that folks can say whatever they want so only charles and kay and i have to uh uh, watch ourselves, and I'm not really worried about that. Um, so it's just a pleasure. This is our closing think tank of the semester, and Faith will put additional information in the chat about our Convergence Innovation Competition and our eSports uh, inaugural summit coming up in December. Um, but I'm really thrilled that this is uh, bookending our discussions um, about iPads research and about the work that we're doing uh, to combat racial injustice, to work towards social equity. And so uh, what we're going to have today is a fireside chat. So you have to imagine um, uh, the chairs, the fire, the conversation. I'm sitting in between uh, Dean K. Husband's Feeling and Dean Charles Isbell with you in the Synergy space. Um, and we're gathering together as a community for a no presentations, no slides, uh, just a, a frank uh, honest and hopefully um, I also anticipate an inspiring conversation about what our community can do together. As we uh, sent out in the call for uh, you to attend this event, um, IPAT's leadership put together a letter in July as we were wrestling uh, with the horrific killings of George Floyd, Armand Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Brianna Taylor and others and reflecting on our mission and values and our commitments. And in that letter, and this is going to be a continuation of those discussions, we pledge to amplify black voices, acknowledging our, um, their underrepresented uh, contributions to our STEM and research communities. We work to go much further to incorporate social justice uh, throughout our work. We wanted to provide these types of research experiences, not just to our faculty, but especially to our students and frame, uh, for example, our Convergence Innovation Competition, which was normally around industry-led topics, to be much more about societal goals and societal challenges, and providing a platform for our students to enter in those conversations with our larger community. And then we pledge to be vigilant in monitoring our communication and how we reach out to the community, especially around the opportunities that we provide. So we really were focused on the framing of what does IPAT do as an IRI, um, as an interdisciplinary research institute, and the types of resources and opportunities, leadership and vision that we can provide. So in our conversations today, um, this, is, this is part of a series. So we've, we've been in conversations, we had a, an amazing uh, discussions with Pearl Alexander around our journeys as individuals um, and really heard from members of our black community about their experience uh, as scientists within the research community as a whole. Um, I know many of you have attended other opportunities at the Georgia Tech campus to see um, really convincing presentations on how uh, racial bias and injustice um, frames and it permeates systemically so many of the artifacts and so many of the tools that we use. So I don't think that this conversation is going to be a discussion on if we need to do something, but really needs to be a focus on what can we do. Um, and to that extent, um, and I said I would, I would revert quickly to Kay and Charles, that's why we've asked these two amazing leaders to come talk to us. Uh, so Dean Kay Husband's Feeling is the uh, recently appointed dean of the Ivan Allen College. Um, and uh, we've had the great opportunity to work with her in her leadership with public policy before then. Um, and I think Charles has managed to disappear, but he'll come back. Uh, Dean Charles Isbell, a, a long time, there he's back, long time uh, a colleague and still relatively recent uh, dean of the College of Computing. The two of them know each other well, they know us well. Um, and so that's why there was so much impetus for us to finally wrangle their calendars so that they could be with us today. So um, I'm going to start with a series of questions. Uh, some of them they know about, some of them they don't. Um, and we'll go back and forth and uh, then we're going to open it up to the community. But please feel free to use the chat throughout the discussions, resources, comments, uh, questions that you would like to pose and we will pull from that. 
So um, just to, to warm up for Kay and Charles, you know, as I said, this has been this has been a journey for us so far, and you've learned a bit about that journey for, for IPAT in your discussions with me. But can you tell us a bit about what that journey has been like for you from June, July on? And, you know, from the framing of what you see within the Georgia Tech community, um, because like like the two of you and IPAT, you know, th these have been values that we've held to for some time, and we're going to come back to that. But nevertheless, this moment feels different. Um, and so help us help us get a feeling as to what that's like for you. Okay, please. Go first. <laughs> okay, that's why you disappeared a minute ago. I get it. Well, hi, everyone. And I'm going to share just a little bit of what it's been like on the last few months. I will say just off the bat, um, I'm coming to understand a whole lot better um, what intersectionality means, although I can't really define it for you fully, but I am li definitely living it. Um, but on my list of things that I wanted to share with you, the first thing is, um, of course, being there for students. And students have been reaching out directly to have conversations to not only understand what's going on around us, but what's going on inside and what, how they're feeling about it, coping with it, what can be done. And having these extensive conversations one-on-one, -on -one, um, very, very, very helpful. Um, not just to the students that, you know, what they say and how they respond, but also it's been helpful to me to stay, to stay connected, to understand what's going on. I'd say also faculty and staff and really reflecting on how is this affecting everyone and it, there is an impact of COVID-19 and what we've seen in terms of racism, overt racism disproportionately affecting some individuals and needing to have those discussions as well and also providing um, and, and trying to, I should say, provide ways in which we can connect and have further discussions in this area because no one's solving anything right now, but we are feeling and we need to be able to work through those things. A third thing on my list, I'm on several committees. I won't list them all. I haven't listed, but I'll bore you. But everything, you know, American Academy, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, um, even this morning on the Georgia Intellectual Property Alliance, um, and, and so on, the National Science Foundation, Connect, Council of Canadian Com Academies, all of these organizations, you know, every single call, we're talking about underrepresentation, impact, access. I mean, no one's being shy about bringing it up. And if anyone tries to sort of step away from it, others, allies are bringing it back to the table. This time, I don't have to be the one only saying something, which is actually good. Um, last thing I'll say in this section is that this morning on a National Academy of Public Administration, I'm an elected fellow and I was on the, the call, the Zoom call as they say these days, and someone said, you know, this is not just about reducing to nil, hopefully, unfairness. It is about the presence of opportunity. And they were quoting, and I really appreciated hearing that because oftentimes we know we have to push both pedals. We have to look for a fairer um, society, but we also with it have to present opportunity, opportunities. Really appreciate that. Over Thank you, you Kay. <laughs> and when you can publish uh, your understanding of intersectionality, please uh, put that out there because I, I continue to wrestle with that in, in our research and scholarship, but really, really Absolutely. important. Absolutely. Charles, you gonna jump in here? Sure, and uh, I'll, I'll keep it short. I, I think I have one observation, but though up front, let me apologize to everyone. That is the second time in the last 20 minutes that Blue Jeans has crashed on me for just this call. So it, it, I don't know what's going on. I probably have to reboot my machine and it'll, it might happen again. But you know, you asked the question about our, our journey um, and in particular what, what we've gone through or what we've, what we've seen or felt in the last few months. And, and well, I'd say sort of two things quickly. One is um, this doesn't feel very different from uh, the last 40 or 50 years uh, of my life and that things are still the same way that they are. And, you know, I don't think that uh, things are different in the sense that they are not significantly worse nor are they significantly better. So I don't consider this kind of a new thing. On the other hand, what I do think feels very different and is quite important, particularly for the kinds of discussions that 
uh, we're having now is that these things, when they explode, when they build up, whether you're talking about uh, you know April 29th in the in 1992, or whether you're talking about um, uh, George Floyd, or whether you're talking about pick whatever it is you're talking about, it's typically what happens is you have kind of a build up of uh, frustration or a build up of events or a confluence of different things happening at once. And what I think we're experiencing now, what we've experienced in the last several months is a bunch of different things all happening at once and, and coming together uh, into these these discussions. COVID is a part of it, as, as, as Kate pointed out. Um, specific events um, have become a part of it. It aligns with uh, growth in the last couple of years, uh, really, and sort of focuses on focus on these issues, particularly in universities, particularly uh, in academia. Uh, the government um, has been pushing on this for a, a little while. So a bunch of things sort of happen together uh, and at once. And that feels different. Uh, and I think what's important about it, whether it is different or not, is that it's created an opportunity uh, for conversations around here and these sort of institutional and group conversations that people are willing to have, particularly in the, in the age of uh, social media and easy connection and, and sharing of uh, experiences. The way it's looked like to me uh, personally uh, is that this is the first time that these sorts of big events have happened while I've been sitting on this side of the, of the, of the great dark divide of, of administration. And so now I'm sitting down with large groups of students. I'm talking to uh, people across the country about how to deal with this just as, as, as Kay brought up. And being the one who's being yelled at for not having done something is a completely different uh, experience for me. I'm usually the one yelling at uh, people for not having uh, thought about this or paid attention to it uh, for, um, for many years. And so it's kind of strange and interesting that way. Uh, but I think these conversations, at least for me, have been very different in that regard, in that I feel like maybe there's a chance to actually have a, an impact on the way people think about it. Uh, and that I think for um, the first time in a very long time, uh, I think that organizations and people as a group are really willing to, to grapple with this and, and see what we can, we can do with it. And I, I don't know if this all had happened a year ago or would be happening a year from now. I suspect it would be somewhat different from what we're experiencing, but we're, we're experiencing it in 2020 in the middle of what's apparently going to be a multi-day election day and in, in the middle of lots of energy that's been building up for the last several years and lots of sort of, of sharing of things. So anyway, that's, that's a long and rambly way of saying that the, I think the experience for the last few months has been different only insofar from my point of view is that it's been much more of a shared experience and people are happily, and, and I'm quite, uh, uh, I celebrate this, are very willing and interested in having the kinds of conversations that we're having today. So I'm, I'm quite happy about that and, and looking forward to where these conversations will take us. Terrific. Thank you, Charles. And I know one of the pieces of homework that I did give you, uh, Kay, uh, and it was pretty easy for you to respond was, you know, our community, you know, in addition to amplifying voices is this question of who are role models that we can look for um, at Georgia Tech, nationally, and, you know, as many people are contemplating what it means to take, you know, the research that they've been trained to do for, you know, years, decades, the students who are working with, but then they want to understand how to incorporate notions of racial justice, how to work towards social mm -hmm. equity. They're looking for models and how to do this. Mm -hmm. they, in many places, they haven't been provided those opportunities. So, um, you know, a, a question to you both is, who are some of the, mod the role models that uh, you think our community could be looking to for, for inspiration and guidance? So, I, I put a few in the chat, and when you asked that question, Beth, and I pondered, I just wanted to find in this particular conversation role models of scientists, PhDs, who are also in this particular case, these are African Americans that I know and I really do admire, um, and watch how they not only do their work, which you know a lot of times things can be distracting, but they get the work done, but they also are inclusive and they also are doing things to, as Michelle Norris once said, when I was in her presence, and she said something like, lift while we climb. And so Shirley Malcolm is just amazing. Um, I don't know, many of you probably know her. Uh, she's a biologist by training. She's at the AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science. And she started this program a few years back called Sea Change. And again, I put all the links to the people I'm talking about in the chat. 
And this is about science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. So STEM with two M's, um, equity achievement. That's what the C is for. And then C change. And this was really looking to affirm um, creating truly diverse, equitable, inclusive communities, but specifically in the sciences. And you know, it doesn't mean that you 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 have to go and do something completely different. You can do this while you're working in your field. One person that's like that that I've admired for decades, a good friend, Bill Massey, and anyone that's a QN theorist on this call knows Bill. Um, and he was at Bell Labs. I, uh, Bell Labs paid for me to go to grad school, so that's how I met Bill back at the labs. And he started an organization very, very simply called CARMS. CARMS is a Council for African and Americans in the Mathematical Sciences. And basically every summer he has this get together of researchers and young scholars to just do math and, and present papers on mathematics. Um, at some, some of it's applied math, but much of it is also theoretical math. So again, looking at doing your work, but also lifting while you climb. A third is Jim West. Um, many of you know Jim. He's 89 years old, still trucking. He's at Hopkins. Um, he has 50 U.S. patents and more than 250 foreign patents on microphones. And so if you know his work, but Jim West, Bill Massey, and uh, Bill Wilson, Ben Askew, they are more in the medical area, on um, biomedical. Uh, we gave talks at Harvard, and we gave talk also at Brown um, to students. And these are, I mean, Jim West is amazing, but he's, you know, we all converged, went, talked to students to try to encourage students, um, and these were mainly African-American students and Latino students to um, just go for excellence in their PhD work, go for excellence in the work that they've chosen to do. Um, a another one that I would put on the list, and I'll, I'll stop with this one, is Goldie Berg. Goldie and I were on NIGMS at the National Institutes of Health, so one of their councils, and she is so amazing in the work. She's a biologist in the work she does on, on Alzheimer's. But she's also looking at disparities and how disparities of communities affects the onslaught of Alzheimer's, which affects an entire family. Ask me about that. I've gone through this. And she is just a, a, an amazing scholar. She's a mentor, but she's also really pushing um, forward with the science and making a difference in, in people's lives. So those are the four people I'll put on there. You'll see a fifth one in the chat, Evelyn Hammonds. She's amazing too. Terrific, Kay, this is terrific. Charles, you wanna add to this? So I'd love to, so first off, let me just, just point out that like Kay, uh, Bell Labs paid my way through grad school. In fact, Bell Labs through the CRFP program and, and some okay. of its sister programs can uh, claim to have uh, supported pretty much every single black PhD um, in the sciences, more or less, uh, between hmm. the mid 1980s and the, the mid 1990s, and, and what is, I think, still considered one of the best programs of its kind. And of course, I know Bill Massey quite well. In fact, I spoke at CARMS, I think the second CARMS, I, I gave a, a talk to uh, about information theory. Um, and uh, I, I agree with everything. Um, Kay has said about him. I also uh, agree on Jim West, uh, who gave a wonderful, he is sort of responsible for all the basic work for directional microphones. Um, he has a wonderful, he used to have this wonderful giant lab he would take you into with, where he could uh, manipulate the way sound bounced around a room and then he would shut all sound off and you could hear your heartbeat. It was just a just an amazing, amazing guy. Uh, and, and so just let me agree on both Bill, Bill and Jim. Um, Build it, build apps. Uh, but there's a couple of ways you could you could think about this question. Right? One is about people who, as they've kind of moved through life, have thought very carefully about uh, helping others and their role models in that way. And then I think there's also people who, and I'm thinking specifically of people um, in uh, engineering and computing, uh, who have made um, these kinds of ideas and, and issues around inclusiveness fundamentally a part of their research. So I'll just mention a couple of people in addition to to Bill and um, Jim who are in that space. And so to start with on people who are more like Bill, uh, I would mention Valerie Taylor. Many of you will not know who Valerie Taylor is, but many of you will. Valerie Taylor um, uh, was the first black woman to be chair of an R1 computer science department or something, I think. Um, and for, uh, she's recently, as, uh, she was through the, uh, Chicago, through Northwestern and then eventually found her way um, to College Station uh, and has now left that to go 
um, to Argon Labs to, to go back to what she says, her sort of basic basic research. But she's a founder of Commandit, which is the Center for Minorities and People with Disabilities in IT, CMDIT, Commandit. Um, and she is responsible for running just about every big conference and, and big program that, that's out there that's made this kind of difference. She was a part of uh, working with Bill on CARM. She, um, through her organization, Commandit, she is um, oversees um, the Tapia Conference. She was one of the, the founders of that. Uh, which is the topic conference of celebrating diversity in computing and she's a truly amazing scholar and someone who's put a great deal of energy into this. She's just a couple of years older than I am. Um, she, people tend to think of her as uh, their mother. She's just one of those, those kind of people. Uh, and she's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful individual. I'd also say that there are a lot of people who, um, and there are many people, including at Georgia Tech who care about this, but people who put a lot of energy and effort into thinking about this and merging it with their, their sort of technology research. Uh, people like Tim Nickabru, who's, who's uh, at Google. Um, but I want to focus on one person we all know, Ayanna Howard, who I hope is not on this call and, and embarrassed by this, but she spends um, an enormous am amount of time thinking about robotics, AI, uh, data science, and bias, and how the little decisions that we do in design and the way that we we do AI and machine learning have huge negative impacts on what we do. So she's making a huge scientific contribution. And one of the consequences of the sort of work that she does is not just that it's important, but it also, in the sense that we're talking about, but also that it opens up completely different questions uh, that are interesting in a scientific sense, uh, as well as uh, socially relevant, and it makes sort of a big difference. So when I look to people like her, I see someone who's making a real difference and, you know, is doing all of the things that, you, that you, you're you supposed to do to, to kind of move through um, move through the scientific world and, and through academia, but it's doing something that, that's going to make a difference. And if you look at the people she's mentored, the people uh, she's worked with both uh, at university, but also out in the world, she's made a huge, clear difference in, in the lives of, of lots of people. And so for me, if you want to look close to home, uh, you can look at someone like, like Ayana, uh, who really really is something, someone we can all uh, all look up to in this space. So that is um, um, both both home and far away, and I think Becky is celebrating the Bell Labs connection in the chat as well. Um, just, I, I love hearing these examples, and I do think it's really important for us to be able to provide them, you know, for the old faculty members like myself, as well as for uh, students who are starting these, starting their their work. You know, one of the things I want to push further in this discussion is understanding the kinds of new interdisciplinary work that you could imagine between our communities, between computing uh, and within the human humanities and social sciences. So, you know, one example that has profoundly impacted my work uh, for the past few years has been there's a great group of scholars that, that have looked at issues, uh, Charles, you mentioned um, health disparities. Um, that have looked at questions like a kind of long-standing scholarship within, you know, socioeconomic, uh, uh, social determinants of health, um, but then uh, intersected those with aspects of interactive technologies. So, if and how would you then provide guidance to say, okay, if you're going to do something within mobile technologies, if you just follow the path that, let's say, an HCI path might lead you on, you might actually land up creating technology that works for some and could actually, um, they're called intervention generated inequalities. They could actually increase disparities unintentionally just through how they're deployed and how they're designed and the assumptions they make about whether it's technology liturgy, literacy or access to community resources or just even attitudes around you know, trust and engagement with technologies. So for me, that's, that's had a huge you know, shift in my thinking to not just look at uh, best practices for user-centered design, but to have that framing from social determinants of health be able to guide new ways of looking at research for interactive health technologies. So that's one small example, but what are, what are things that you've seen or you would love to see in terms of deep interdisciplinary work um, between the, you know, the fields that, that the two of you help lead? Charles, you gonna go? Go. No. I like when you go first. Then I get the same answer. Okay, right. Okay. Well, um, I, and I asked him that because you'll see you'll see why. Because my answer, he will pick right up and, and move with it. Um, when I think about this, Beth, um, I am thinking of data and the need to have not just 
the right kind of data to answer the questions that we have in terms of underrepresentation, um, but also the visualization of that data. And I think that's something that crosses between the social sciences and um, computing. Uh, one of my pet peeves recently has been we focus so much on big data, quote unquote, very high volume, large, large amounts of it, and we, we're, we're really pushing the envelope in terms of processing and manipulation of those data. But when you're talking about underrepresentation, it's in the word, it's small. And so the idea is that you need to work on small data. You need to really be able to figure out how to do this without um, having someone discoverable um, to, you know, to make sure that there's privacy <laughs> and all of that. So I want to see us work together on ways in which to push the envelope in that respect. Um, the other thing that I would add to this is then this is the part where Charles can chime in and speaks to something that Jan is working on as well, um, the launch of the Ethics Center. Um, and it's, you know, Ethics, Ethics, Technology, and Human Interaction Center for Society uh, was originally the title. And the For Society is now the X because uh, that's why it has that X with an exponent just so that everybody knows. But Ethics is that combination of the technologists and the ethicists and the philosophers, the humanists, and we're really trying to get to a place where we work together. As you said, um, Beth, earlier, first we have to understand one another, and we're spending a lot of time working through that, so that's one of the tough parts about interdisciplinary work. It doesn't just happen because you have a good idea, but then we are committed to it, and we're committed to trying to solve some major problems and to unpack some major questions, to really understand the kernel of the question, not just some kind of topic, but really getting down to the bottom of things. So those are the two major things that I would put on the table. Um, and back to the previous question, the person that I think is kind of working in this area, aside from Iyana, would also be Kamal Bob, who has a degree in public policy and obviously a degree in computing. Actually, Kamal's, Kamal's PhD is in public policy from Georgia Tech, but both his undergraduate and master's degree uh, from Berkeley um, are, is in um, electrical engineering, I believe. Oh. Right? He's, he's definitely sort of decided that he wanted to bring those two, two things together. I'm actually glad you, you brought up Kamal in particular because I think that, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically answer a slightly different question from the one you asked about because I think that, you know, we're kind of talking to ourselves here in some sense, people who would come to a most people who come to a, a discussion like this kind of already believe in why this is important, but um, it, it helps to make, I think, an argument of why it's actually important. And this is something Kamal feels very strongly about, and I, I agree with him, and I think, so I want to just kind of surface what, what that argument is, at least for me. So, you know, uh, Kay is absolutely right about the interdisciplinary work that we need to do. Um, I think the Ethics Center is a great example of this. I actually think the College of Computing is very proud for being a, a part of so many efforts like that. And of course, Kay and I personally go back into working with ways that we can connect with public policy, but it goes well beyond, well beyond, absolutely. Well, be, well beyond that. But I, mm -hmm. I think there's a kind of a, a more important issue for us that I think people here already believe, but again, I think it's worthwhile saying explicitly, which is, Computing has become machine learning, data science, but all of computing has become just too important, right? So every field that's successful, at least every successful technological field has this kind of moment, right? Where, you know, you, you build a bad user interface and a plane crashes and people die, or you, um, uh, you know, build a, build a, an embedded system that gets in a controller that goes awry and somebody um, gets way too much radiation and dies of cancer as a result. Uh, or your simple little algorithm that does prediction um, is responsible for increasing the average amount of time that a subset of the population spends in jail because you weren't thinking very carefully about what the algorithm was and how the data was being used. Machine learning, computing, these are the fields that we're, many of us are in now reach that moment. We have to think very carefully about what it means to have an impact on the real human world. And that is a you can make an economic argument out of it if you want to. Um, you can make an argument of self-preservation for the field out of it, but I think it's actually fundamentally a moral argument. And the moral argument is that we can no longer pretend as a field that we are um, alone, um, and everything that we do by necessity has to connect with 
uh, the rest of the world, has to connect with the ways that we're going to touch people. And if we're going to connect with the ways that we touch people, then we have to talk to people who spend their time worrying about people and understanding people. And more importantly, I think even more important than um, talking to uh, the sociologist uh, two buildings down or, or bringing in the, the, the health expert from Emory or whatever, is we have to talk to the people who are directly going to be affected, affected yes. by the technology that we develop and bring them into the, the design and understanding what, what the problems are. Again, my guess is that almost everybody in the call here believes that already, but I don't think we say it often enough and clearly enough that it is a, both a kind of economic and moral necessity. So the people I find most interesting are the ones who've been able to do that, um, who go into the communities where they are and think very carefully uh, about that. I wish I could say that it's the sort of thing that I've, I've done in my own work, um, and I put a lot of time and energy into this, but I personally haven't done that as, as much as I should for a whole host of reasons. Um, I'm not sure that the infrastructure of academia is well designed to support that, at least particularly in the, the fields that we're in. Um, we don't, it's not clear that we understand it, we get caught up in notions of, uh, you know, how it improves our H index or not, or, or you know, what does it mean to be a part of a particular community, uh, which I think distracts us from the kind of fundamental responsibility of, of what it is that we're doing. So um, again, I could pick on some of the, the people that I've, I've mentioned before who've done this, uh, including people like Tim, again, including um, people like, like Ayana, who's, who's put a lot of energy effort. There are people on this call, I see some of them here, who've done work for that and computing for good and, and a whole variety of a whole variety of efforts like that. And I just think that, you know, that's the thing that we, we, we have to celebrate. That's the kind of question um, that we, we have to ask. So there you go. No, that's terrific. And I think I want to pick up on your comment about um, infrastructure of academia, right? So you know, part of why we have IRIs is that we're supposed to be creating platforms, resources. We're supposed to be creating infrastructure. We do that literally. Um, uh, pre pre iPad, but you know the wear home is a particular unique point of infrastructure that um, you wouldn't expect. Well, maybe you'd expect it out of Gregory, but you wouldn't expect a single faculty member to be able to raise the funds and do all of the work necessary to create that kind of laboratory. But you can imagine doing it collectively uh, for for a group of folks, and then it changes the game for the other faculty and the other students that can then look at the future future of home technology. So a critical question for, for any IRI is, you know, we have limited time, we have limited resources, what types mm -hmm. of big infrastructure, what types of big projects should we pursue? Because then, it, Charles, as you said, it, it, it makes it easier for then the rest of the faculty and students to to draft in a good way on that to be able to, to shift uh, their research and the things they want to do. So, Kay and I were, were talking about this. I don't think many people on this will remember. I think Caroline's going to remember. Before there was an iPad, uh, before there were IRIs, uh, we were working on a moonshot problem that we called One Million Healthy Children. Um, and it came from a group of us working together. And what we posed, Caroline's smiling, she remembers. Um, the question was, what could you do in healthcare to improve the lives of one million children in the state of Georgia? And it was a galvanizing problem, and part of the reason for the one million is, is that was approximately the number, actually now it's even larger, of children that are on Medicaid. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, the, the, the least resource um, uh, healthcare uh, setting, um, really, in the, in the United States. And so it forced us to create different kinds of infrastructure so our researchers could even tackle that. So what came out of that? Well, that was a real huge impetus for the partnership with Children's uh, Healthcare of Atlanta. You know, that notion of one million healthy children helped really drive many aspects of that particular part of, the, of that partnership. Um, and now we had the Pediatric Technology Center. And it wasn't the only thing, but it was, a, it was a huge part. It drove us to get the Medicaid data set. So talking about data and the kinds of data we need. This data is, Matt can laugh, it's like notoriously difficult for us to get, for us to protect, for us to secure, but it's a game changer for people like Nicoletta Serben who can do research on access to healthcare um, in new ways. Um, it also forced us to think differently. Uh, instead of, folk, you, can't, you can't target one disease and improve the lives of one million mm. children. You can't 
You can't have a disease approach to it, which is common in medical science. So we had to look at the system of how healthcare is delivered to even think that we could shift the experience of, of 1 million children. So it forged new collaborations. And so you know, this is the thing I think that what IRI should be trying to do, like what are these kinds of big audacious moonshot problems that we can go after and we may we're not going to we may not be successful we're not going to be able to at any point in time say yes we did it one million children just got a better life but because of that so many things fell out of that audacious goal that really shifted the community in a number of ways so if you could you know think now and please stay in conversation with us what are the kinds of you know amazing challenges that you think our community could work on together that would have that game you know that that downstream impact of just providing new kinds of infrastructure academic infrastructure uh, for our leadership so when i when i said academic infrastructure i meant something slightly different but i love the path that you you're, you're taking this down I, I think the important thing there is is thinking about a gigantic problem that would force you outside of whatever your, your sort of narrow interests are. So mm -hmm. you, you pick something like touching a, a million kids, uh, you can pick something that's very different. It turns out to have all these kind of interesting side effects. It forces you to, to think through about what the problems really are. Now they get very messy, of course, um, and sometimes it's very difficult to, to figure out um, how I'm gonna take the nugget out of here to get the paper published that's gonna allow me to get my H index one more higher so that I can get a tenure and, and promote it to a, to a social professor or whatever. But if we think about these as big hairy problems, I think the right thing comes out. I'll pick something completely different, um, but I it just, it res what you said really sort of hit me because uh, you described a path that's very similar to a path that, that some of us are walking down on. Um, here's a really simple problem. We wanna educate every single um, high school student in Georgia. Um, they want to understand enough about computing so that they can go do really cool things. This is an education, but it turns out it has all of these technological implications. So you sit there and you go, what would it take to, to reach all these people? You start doing the math. Turns out there's like 600,000 high school students in the state of Georgia. Uh, Georgia is the largest state east of the Mississippi. We're one of the fastest growing states. We have a population whose demographics are increasingly looking like Arizona's. We look very different uh, from what we look like even 30, 30 years ago, or even 20 years ago, uh, for that matter, huge change is, is happening. Uh, one of those things is a massive influx of uh, Spanish-speaking people um, who, for some reason, uh, are not moving into cities, but moving into rural Georgia, which puts a huge um, pressure on infrastructure that where Georgia has uh, deployed it traditionally. Uh, and there just simply isn't, it isn't easy for Georgia, even if Georgia decides it wants to do something about this, to kind of do the right thing to help parents to be able to educate their kids. But if you wanted to focus, focus, uh, focus specifically uh, on computing, say, uh, you start seeing some really interesting numbers. So do you want to know how many Spanish teachers there are, certified Spanish teachers there are in the state of Georgia for high school? There's 15,000. And by the way, that's about right. That's about what you need once you kind of work out the math and the number of people. And that's just Spanish, by the way. That's not German and, and French. <laughs> so 15,000 Spanish teachers. As of two years ago, three years ago, uh, there were 93 certified computer science teachers, right? So if 15,000 is what you need to get everyone, or the people who want it Spanish, you definitely need more than 93 in computer science. But why is that Why is that so? Why is that a problem? Well, first off, even if you gave me a billion dollars, I'm not gonna get 93 to 15,000 in the next 10 years. It's just not physically possible. Uh, you can't train enough people. It takes too long to train them. It just sort of can't happen. So then you immediately have to come up with some other kind of solution. You gotta work with people. You gotta get, figure out the geographic distribution of where, where people are, recognize it's impossible to actually get, even if you could train those people, deploying the people across the state is fundamentally impossible uh, at the sort of level of density that you would need it to be done. And you just sort of hit this big wall. And the reason I bring that up, it is actually I think is very similar to the 1 million kids make their, make, make their lives better, is it's a really, really hard problem that forces you to grapple with uh, fundamental structural and, uh, problems. And, and by the way, you know, for, for what we're talking about, how, in, how we want to impact with inclusion and diversity and all and the things that we're talking about now, these things have highly non-uniform uh, disparate impacts on, on people with various backgrounds, as you might imagine. And so you have to now take all of that into account and you have to work with local people. And I'm not even going to talk about the fact that, you know, we have the second highest number of counties of any state in the, in the, in the United States. And so therefore we have that many different um, uh, different uh, school systems to deal with, which means 
you know, we, everyone's at their own one off and you've got to figure out how to work with the government. You have to figure out how to work with um, activists who've been out in the world as well as educators and so on to, to kind of solve this problem. And I'm not going to talk about the solutions that we've, we've had or anything that's in some, some sense beside the point. I think what's, what's important here is that those kinds of questions that you ask force you to think very carefully about how your technology and, or what it is that you're going to bring to bear, the way of thinking has to interact with the realities of the world and the history that's built in. I mean, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, we have a large number of private schools in the state of Georgia. Almost all of them were founded after 1956. Yep. And that's built into the oh. system. <laughs> and that's built into the system. Yeah. So, so yesterday, Beth, when we were talking uh, and we were kind of uh, moving around talking about Moonshot, um, two things. One, we knew there was an impetus for it. And we, we have to get to the point where we really know what is the what is the prod or what is the thing that really gets our attention to get disparate individuals, all the folks that Charles has enumerated between government and private sector and philanthropies, everyone to focus and say, we have to fix this. And the second thing I would say is that when you mentioned the one mil, I mean, it was just a clear, crisp, short sentence, like, let's do this. And it's hard to get there, but it, when you said it, it was so simple, but it, we all knew how hard it was. So I don't really have a great answer to it because I've been thinking about it for a day, but what would I put on the table? But I do know elements of it, right? I know pieces of it that I would want to see. So I, this may make Caroline happy, may Rebecca, maybe Barrett kind of happy, but you talk to folks at the Sloan Foundation and Gates Foundations in particular. Gates has this um, equitable futures. So they have laid out some of the things that they really want to partner on. And you know how they always say it's partnership. And they want to do some stuff here. They want to do some stuff in Atlanta and they want to do some stuff in the Southeast. Um, they also have some things on par pathways. I know some folks there. I know the CFO at Gates and I know somebody else. Um, Sloan Foundation is also one, and we talked about Sloan the other day too, and I could go through a variety of foundations where they have actually identified what some of those, you know, longer wins, if not moonshot, but things that are not quick wins, but things that really take this assembly and interdisciplinary approach to get there, at least to get part of the way there. So I would say that we have, we could begin to identify those resources. And some of the things that you want to work on would be there. Um, the other, only other thing I would add is that there was a time, uh, I led this, um, it was an NSF funded project and uh, we had a meeting um, in Boston when NSF was still in, in Arlington instead of Alexandria and right across the street from NSF on the science of broadening participation in STEM. And we had Hannah Valentine come and give a talk. And if you know Hannah Valentine, Dr. Valentine, you know she just was inducted into the National Academy of Medicine. Um, she is amazing. Hopefully you know her. If you don't, you have to get to know her and have her come give a talk. And she talked about the hubs of innovation, NIH hubs of innovation. I know Paul Baker's on the line and Paul was part of that. Um, initiative back in 2016, and he knows exactly what I'm talking about here. And this hub, hubs of innovation, she has a model, and they never executed on it because it was an idea. But they had, you know, partnerships with industry, ac the academy, and communities, just like Charles was saying. The outcome was really going to be STEM jobs, but the inputs were people. So we're looking at mentoring and training and all of this. We we're talking about communication and dissemination of information and back to communities. We're not talking about doing research on people. We're talking about doing research with people. And I always have to say that for, for obvious reasons. And there's a whole other portion of different inputs and outputs and connections here. And I'm looking at a slide, the slide that she gave and presented in that meeting. And I love the platform. You asked about platforms and infrastructures, and I really like the way she conceived of it, and it hasn't happened. So there may be opportunity to pull something like that together, plus work with a philanthropy or work with one of those um, organizations that really already has identified one, two, or three different big items, big challenges, if not moonshot, at least real big challenges. And we have the talent to do it. 
um, that, that I'll leave it there. That's perfect. Thanks, Kay. So I, I could keep going with you two all day, but I want to share uh, the wealth. So there's some been some discussion in the, the chat. Um, they've actually been answering each other's questions. I'm not quite sure which ones they want to, to tee up as a question into the, the group. Um, but Gregory, you were, you were first there, so uh, passing it to you if you want to jump in here. Uh, no, that's okay. I think there are actually better questions after mine, so you can go on. All right. Um, I'm looking also, so, okay, they're just taking this all on their own. Okay. Um, just wave if you want to ask a question. I'm looking to Isabel and Becky as well. So there's a this is Isabel. I don't want to ask a question. Just um, if you want to start in this work, like I said in the chat, start with one student um, who needs some help, and that's the best way to start. Thank you're not. You. You're not I... gonna. You can't save the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate that. And there's been a lot of discussion. So if uh, you guys are catching up in the chat, there's you know this question of. What does it mean for folks to work in a group that they are not a natural member of that community? Um, oh, so if you want to partner uh, mm -hmm. with a group uh, that is underrepresented or um, you know marginalized in, in some particular way, but that's not your natural affinity group, you know what what are the ways to go about that that are authentic, that are ethical? Um, and what are some of the success stories or models that, you know, that we could learn from the two of you and from each other uh, to do that going forward? Um, and I think one of the things that Isabel and Becky were both pointing to in this discussion is one approach is that, um, you know, partnering with our students uh, is a great way uh, to do that. Um, and that that's also lends itself to the importance of having such a diverse student body because they bring those authentic experiences into our community and provide avenues for that. Um, Becky will laugh. I know she'll remember when Genevieve Bell came and gave a talk um, about her work as a cultural anthropologist in Intel and what it meant to bring computing to uh, not the US uh, parts of the world. And the long, long line of students who were waiting to speak with her because she was speaking to their lived experience and speaking to their homes and their communities and how just strongly that resonated with them. Um, so, you know, the challenges of, you know, when we do work with subjects of convenience that are from our own, our own worlds, um, how we, we shut out those conversations. Yeah, it might be just worth contextualizing that Genevieve uh, uh, grew up in Aboriginal Australia. So, uh, and so she, she, she can talk about rural technology use in a way that she also knows how to uh, extract water from frogs, which is a very handy thing to know. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, we've been having a lot. I actually think, Gregory, your question was great. I, and I think it's, um, uh, I, I was sort of well, wanted to let echo. Me, let me follow on just a little bit. <laughs> so for those that don't know, I, I, I have a lot of involvement in neurodiversity. Um, and it's mm -hmm. because I mm -hmm. am raising two children with autism. Mm -hmm. So I see it every day. Mm -hmm. um, I have been, when I have reached out uh, to try to get advice on how to handle or how to deal with or how to support African Americans, I naturally reach out to African Americans. Um, because mm -hmm. when people want advice on autism, they naturally reach out to people like me. Or it, so um, I've been perplexed by the response saying um, you shouldn't reach out to the underrepresented individuals because they have too much on their plate. Now, everyone always asks them to do that. But the flip side of that is that they have the lived experience. You all know or should know the expression, know about us without us. Uh, um, so I, I feel this frustration that we shouldn't put the burden on the underrepresented individuals, and yet they are the ones that have the richest and deepest contribution to provide. And I know this because I live it. So by the way, I, so I was giving a talk at um, University of Minnesota last week or week before, uh, not at, I mean, I was in my office, I was here, but you know, um, 
around these issues, I was asked to do that. And I got asked a version of this, or what Gregory's bringing up is a version of the question is, and how do we do this in such a way that we, um, we don't burden people? Uh, and I'll tell you the same answer I told them, which is you can't avoid it. it cannot be avoided. Um, that doesn't mean it's good. And, uh, and Kay may have a very different feeling about this, but um, I, I just think it's impossible. I think what you may be hearing, Gregory, and I'm now going to project my own experiences onto others I have not met, uh, is just, you know, you go through cycles of being tired. Like I'm yeah. tired of answering this question, so please don't, answer, don't ask me the question. But then there are times when I'm like, okay, I'm perfectly happy to answer the question and to, to be reached out to. And so, you know, you go through the cycles uh, that you go through. But that, that question, the way it was asked to me, was actually asked in a slightly different context, what I think is worth bringing up here when we talk about things like academic infrastructure, is it was said that the, how do you do this in a way by, by, to avoid burdening people and to have them do things that are not valued by, in this case, academia, uh, mm. which I thought was an interesting, uh, an interesting formulation. And I think it's right. I mean, I understand the premise behind it. I don't even really disagree with the premise behind it, but it is, it, it accepts a kind of framing that I would want to avoid. It, the question is who? So first off, if you don't think we value it, value this sort of work, you have to ask yourself, well, whose choice is that? Because the truth is we, we choose to value things, right? We're the ones, I can promise you, sitting up at the Institute and having conversations about tenure and promotion and you know what people like and what people don't like and what they're willing to support and what they're not willing to support. You know, the, the, the narrowness happens at the leaves. Right? It's the faculty who make decisions about what they care about. As you move up through the chain, people tend to be much more open-minded about you know, what counts as scholarship or what counts as impact. So we ourselves are um, sort of our, our worst enemy in, in that regard. But I do think there are, there are things that happen as a result of this. I'll just give you a statistic because I haven't had the spreadsheet up in front of me. Kay has, Kay has heard this before. Um, of the 32 black faculty at Georgia Tech, uh, 11 of them are academic administrators. So in fact, of the professors, all but three, full of professors, all but three are academic administrators, deans, chairs, vice presidents. So for good or for ill, if you were to take Georgia Tech as somehow representative of something, it is pretty clear that the black faculty here eventually move into academic administration and what we might call um, a somewhat more service mindset. Um, and apparently have just taken on the idea that it's worthwhile doing these extra things. Because when you talk to people like Kay, you talk to people like me, or I could name the other 10, um, they always have a conversation like this. They're willing to sort of push a little bit of extra energy, energy into that. And apparently it leads to a certain kind of career path. I don't know what my point is there. <laughs> <laughs> but just to say, I guess that at the end, it's unavoidable. So I think what I would appreciate is just that people appreciate that I am carrying that extra burden and I'm willing to do it. I have absolutely, as all you all are carrying your own burdens in your own way for, for different things, um, some of which have come up today. Uh, and just, you know, be okay when I would like to take the week off. Can, can, let me just add a, a couple of points there. I think one would be be very careful doing that with students because sometimes students feel that if they're the one in the classroom and something about race comes up, then every head pivots and looks and you don't want to be that. I mean, that's not what you signed up for. So I, I, I would say that um, I, I kind of draw the line at the students and say, well, let students be students. And if they elect to be outspoken about something, fine. If they're not, that's okay. Secondly, um, even if we um, say look or peer African American, um, we may have really different experiences depending on where we're from. Um, the way I speak, you wouldn't guess that I'm not from the US, <laughs> but I'm not. But then again, I understand the experiences very well, of course. Um, and so you have to also be careful with the fact that it's a not, we're not monolithic and we have very different experiences and have experienced racism in very different ways. So um, our responses may be different. And I think the third thing I would say is 
we could look at it as a burden or challenge. We can look at it as putting on, putting burden on someone or sharing the challenge. And maybe that's just too nuanced and too frou frou. But the point is, I'm trying to make is, if it's like, let's work on this together, as opposed to you tell me what I need to do for you. And that the latter is harder to bear consistently. Um, and so then when Charles says, sometimes we want a break, yeah. But the word that I would put to all of this is leadership. And at the beginning of this call, uh, we were really asking, and Beth was really digging in on leadership. Who are the leaders? Who are the people that we look to? And when you assume that position of leadership, then you kind of know that some of this you're taking on, and this is just part of what you do. Um, and that's why I go back to even among students, some are leaders that want to be on the forefront, but many students just want to say, hey, I'm just doing calculus. You know, <laughs> I don't need to yep. answer yep. this question or in bio about, you know. Um, and so I, I just wanted to put those two points out there. No, that's I, really I important. One, one thing to that, um, Beth, I'm sorry. Uh, one of the things that I really appreciated about Valerie is between her and Bryant York and a few other people, they kept me from doing a bunch of things I otherwise would have done. Uh, as a grad student and even as a young assistant professor uh, and protecting me from myself. And uh, I think that's a that's actually quite important. It was certainly important for me. Yep, now I appreciate that both Charles and Kay and the caution around, you know, there are students where, you know, this is their agenda and their mission and what they want to do. And then there are other students who are like, that is that is not who I am right now and do not mm -hmm. do not force me to to play that yeah. role. Yeah. You know, some of the voices I want to bring into this, I see Chantel and, and Paul and others, you know, one of the things that I've learned probably more from the disability community is that there are ways that we can do this um, systematically. So I, I think within the disability community and some to sit in the healthcare community, having, quote, patient family advisory board, uh, advocacy boards, that one thing that research centers can do is to make it easy so that an individual student doesn't say, you know, hey, I would like to work with, you know, people with cognitive impairments. How am I going to go find one? Um, you know, they can tap into research centers and infrastructure that we make that easy. So, you know, we have a C grant program and actually some of our classes now, Craig Zimmerin and Jennifer DeBose are doing this. These are students that are getting their Georgia Tech educational opportunity, uh, which allows them to tap into and meet with people who have volunteered um, and they're, you know, they have mild cognitive impairment, uh, you know, they're worried about Alzheimer's, but they're meeting with these student groups. That's impossible to do on a one-off in any sustainable way, but we can set that up and provide those kinds of opportunities. And as I said, I think I've learned that more from CACP and, you know, now what's called City, um, just how much that can be a game changer for, for our students and for our researchers. Mm -hmm. So I know yeah. we're at time and we're starting to lose some folks. So I don't know how long I'm going to stay here. I'm always the last one with the lights on. Um, I don't know how long Kay and Charles can stay. Um, but so we will thank them now and recognize that some people have to leave. But, you know, this is the best part of my day. So I'm also going to going to just keep going with this. So but Kay and Charles, I, I know your schedules are incredibly busy. So I don't know how much longer we have you. I can hang out for a little bit. I do have something. I mean, my days go from eight to eight often. So, but I do have some. <laughs> so I have something after this. I'd love to hear Paul uh, or Brad chime in based on what you just said, though. Um, not to oh, pick yeah, on I mean, anyone. Miss Brad, and this is my show, right? But this is yours, Beth. Yep. You just served it up. <laughs> and <laughs> yep. Well, Beth, uh, I'll, I'll certainly add, you know, my perspective in in working with um, people with disabilities in, in general. Uh, you know, I started this, uh, you know, path 20 years ago when I pivoted from the design for um, larger systems to the design for to support people with functional limitations. And and two lessons that I really had to learn uh, quite often the hard way, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, is there there's there is no person with a disability, right? There are individual people that happen to have mm -hmm. functional limitations and different experiences. And unfortunately, you can't you can't solve a problem just by talking to an individual person because their collective experiences 
are all different. You have to have different tools and different approaches to be able to address the needs of, of uh, such a diverse group. And I would imagine it's similar here as well, right? although I don't speak from a position of expertise there. The, the, the other thing that I had to learn um, along the way is that we can't ask the population, in this case, people with disabilities, to do the heavy lifting to solve their own problems in some cases, right? It's, it, it's not sufficient to go ask them and then write it down and then think that's the solution, right? Yeah. This is not the stenographer's model of how to design something, right? It's, 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 it's about using the tools that, you know, Georgia Tech has provided me as a, as a student when I was coming through Georgia Tech, using those tools, but, but listening to the experiences, listening to the needs of people with disabilities, understanding where their, their pain is and, and where their difficulties lie, observing the context in which they go about their lives and, and putting that together, right? And, and coming up with solutions and then testing it and getting feedback and then improving on it, right? It's, it's a journey, it's not, a, it's not an end state. So um, you know, I, I would say just keep those two things in mind when, when solving, uh, trying to solve these problems. Yeah, and if, if I can just weigh in here for a moment, this is Chantal with the uh, uh, Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation. So great point, uh, Brad. I think one of the things that some of you have heard me say in the past, so we do a lot of work um, with uh, people with disabilities and for the disability community and in the disability community. And, um, you know, I think as researchers or academics, the risk is that our interactions are very transactional. And so really, I think what we should strive for um, if we really want to have social impact and change is being transformational. And a lot of that is you cannot just come in and walk out. And so what the implication of that is that it's a long-term, it's a commitment. And the implication of that is very often um, it needs to be funded somehow. You know, one of our biggest struggles with a lot of the great community partners that we, uh, that we have is that, you know, it's all love, right? Yeah. It's all nonprofits and uh, how do you get funding behind it? So I think the yeah. point that was made earlier around, um, you know, maybe industry involvement that, you know, this is, it's not gonna come off the ground uh, and be sustainable on the basis of love and no matter how loving we are together. And so I think the real, um, you know, it, it would make a huge difference if there is structural uh, support behind it and financial support, because then actually a lot of those communities will be able to, you know, they will want to meet with you and they will want to make the effort they love to work with us and, and talk with us and, you know, collaborate and co-design and all of those, you know, cool things we talk about, but it needs to be feasible and sustainable. And I apologize for the background noise. I'm, uh, I've been taking a walk uh, and I'll just leave it there, but those are my two cents, transformational and sustainable. Yeah. No, thank you, Chantel. And those, um, I think those go together uh, so much, um, you know, one of the methodologies we look towards is this notion of action research. And action research means that you can actually create that holistic engagement, that sustained engagement. And so that comes down to the resources to, to enable that. Um, while we still have folks, I know Howard put uh, a comment in there. So Howard, I'm just gonna ask you to, to turn on your mic and, and post this to, to Charles and Kay. Sure, so my question was, you know, thoughts about, um, social and economic equity. So at Georgia Tech, you know, I, I'm a graduate, you know, I worked there for a long time. And, you know, you know, if you squint, we have smart people paying for the privilege to get educated by other very smart people. Um, and there's you know, a lot of sameness in that. You know, now I work at 
a park, a public park, where it's free and accessible to everybody. Rich, poor, young, old, black, white, straight, gay. Um, how might a place like Georgia Tech improve upon social and economic equity? Hmm. Well, I'm hey, glad Howard, we saved the easy question. This is Caroline for Wood. Us. Barrett had to go, um, or he would have been happy to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I'm the economist on the panel, so I guess I'm supposed to have a good answer to that. Um, I mean, it has to start with access and inclusion sounds, again, pat, but that if you're not here, you don't get the benefit. Um, and so that's point one. Point two, if you're here and the climate is such that you just want to get out, finish, not connect, then you don't get to step off into those really great positions that are there, should be there for everyone. Um, so it's important. I mean, my own experience when I was in graduate school was that I lived a very independent life, even independent of my advisor, though I finished and everything was great, but I did something kind of weird. I, I did use the mathematical model on game theory model and I was putting some data to it and it wasn't what he did, but I liked it, so I did it. Um, but when it came time to um, publish and do other things, I really felt outside of the other groups of folks that were working on things. I felt that um, I didn't have certain types of, now I know what I was missing and now I know the kinds of connections that I needed. Um, so my point is, it, it, there isn't a, um, an easy answer because it isn't a straight from point A to point B answer. It isn't like you do this and you get this kind of resolve. Otherwise it would have been done. I think it's all of these fragments of being here, access, climate, um, networks, um, allowing the individuals to put on the table some really wackadoodle ideas and not shut it down and say, ah, oh, we don't do things that way, but let's let, let's explore. I mean, is that openness also um, in creativity? And that's the whole purpose for having the diverse thoughts and minds at the table. And so I, I don't have a good answer to how do we get from, you know, being here at Georgia Tech to more equity in terms of economic opportunity. I don't know how to get from that point, one point to the other point easily. But if you're not here, you don't get there. So we have to have access and we have to lower the barriers in many different ways that we're all talking about recently. But then there are other points along the way where, again, the mentoring, the networks, the access, the um, allowing contributions to be not standard. All of that acceptance is necessary. And I'm saying that as a, an African-American woman, but when I say acceptance, that also probably goes for other groups as well. So I, I don't have much to add to that, but I will say two things. One is, so first off, absolutely access. Um, that's sort of the, the thing that we have. And if Georgia Tech is good at nothing, it is good at scale uh, and in everything that we do, not just in engineering and computing, for example. You know, we have the largest PhD program in architecture in the country. We're just big, we do, we do scale. We do scale very well, um, and, I, and I think focusing on things like access and our public mission is an important way to think about how to, to have uh, an impact on, on inequity um, and what's out there in the world. I'll point out that, you know, the OMSCS, we have 11,000 students. I mean, the College of Engineering by students is 41% of the university. The College of Computing is 39%, and it's because of that. And by the way, uh, of those 11,000 students, the percentage of underrepresented minorities is more than twice of what it is on campus. And given that the number of students is literally two orders of magnitude, it means anybody who's taught um, in that program in the last year has probably taught more underrepresented students than pretty much everyone else in the college combined over the last 10 years, right? So you can have that, and by the way, how do we do it? We did it by admitting every single person we thought it could succeed. So we're admitting 65% of the students, not 10% of the students and it's having a measurable impact, right? So I, I think focusing on our ability to do scale and being willing to do some things we wouldn't be 
willing to do normally is a way of doing that, uh, which brings me to the second point where I wanted to add to Kay. Kay said, you know, if it were that easy, it would have already been done. I have a slight disagreement with that. I think often it's just a matter of choosing to do it. The hard part is finding the will to do it. And so many, so many things you're able to change uh, just by convincing people that they can do it and they have a responsibility to, uh, and then they do. It's not saying it's trivial. Kay's point is completely, completely right. These things are difficult, but so much of it is given the resources we have, the power that we have, the things that we're able to do, if we just decide we want to, it can just happen. Oh, look, I'm getting a call for the meeting. Yeah, that sounds almost like a Jeopardy sitting in that quiet. And <laughs> that was a hard question, um, but you did get $200. Um, in the chat, I did put a few articles um, on uh, rural innovation by Tim Wojan. I know Tim, he's done a survey years ago. And when you're talking about access, that's another piece of it too. Um, finding creativity and innovation in areas that we don't, where we usually don't look. So I'm going to take that well-known sound of a team's notification to recognize that we're probably losing Charles and I know Kay's got more to do tonight. Yeah. Paul, I saw you, so I'm going to stay around for people who can continue this conversation. It is just, um, it's been so wonderful to See everyone to have this conversation. Thank you very much, Deans Kay and Dean Charles. Uh, you know, just uh, uh, fantastic. Hopefully, this won't be the only time that you come in and talk with us like this. Uh, we'd like to to check back in with you. Um, and I think more importantly, uh, everything in the chat, the resources, um, and the the challenge to us, the challenge and the opportunities that I think we can provide are profoundly important. So. Uh, thank you, thank you again. I know folks are dropping out. I said hi to Caroline's cute little dog. Um, and um, again, I will be the last one here, but um, thank, thank you, you and really, really so appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for Bye, everyone.